Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Hi. Rita. Um, I am a GP registrar and an academic working in London. My name is Mesh, I'm a, a lung doctor working in London as well, um, doing a bit of research on coronavirus. Yeah, and um, we've been having some conversations about all the various sort of WhatsApps and messages and memes and um, questions that had been sort of thrown at us by various family members. I seem to wake up most days with something from a family member saying, Rita, is this right? And like, what, what do you think about that? Um, and so we thought it might be quite good to just uh, jump on here and chat to you about some of the myths that might exist around coronavirus and sort of help to debunk and understand them. Yeah, it's like a pretty unique time when everyone's got access to all the information and able to comment on it and make suggestions and have ideas and and that's a good thing and it also can can create some uh, myths in the process um uh, some of which can gain a bit of traction and can actually worry people more than they maybe should so um it would be good to explore those in a bit more detail uh, today yeah, great. I'm excited. Are you excited? Very. And Gary's going to set us up with one now. Okay. Gargling salt water protects you from getting coronavirus. Slash, if I drink lots of water, that dislodges the virus from my throat. Yeah, so actually my mum sent me this one, which was, um, uh, I think it was just like viral like WhatsApp that was going around. I think generally it's quite good with those sorts of WhatsApps to look at the spelling because they always seem to have some spelling mistakes and they'll usually say at the beginning, you know, this is an official government announcement, but then it's just written in this like very unclear way with lots of mistakes in it. So I'm like, mum, like even that <laughs> should, be, <laughs> should, um, should be a sign that maybe it's, you know, uh, it's maybe not factual. Um, but I think that one, what it said was, um, drink water every 15 minutes to stop it from dislodging in, or stop it lodging in your throat. What do you think, Mesh? Um, so, I mean, firstly, it, it mainly infects cells that um, line the, the back of the nose um, where water probably wouldn't go when you're drinking mm. uh, unless you, you know, unless it goes the wrong way um, or the cells lining the lung, which again, shouldn't, uh, be involved in any swallowing so um that's one thing um but i'd say as well the lining of the throat is um is kind of is is covered in mucus and that's important to ca catch bacteria in to prevent them going any further down but it, it's actually an oil-based fluid which um, doesn't really dissolve with water and so it kind of stays stuck on the lining of your throat which means once the virus has got in there it might just be able to burrow its way or it doesn't really burrow that's a lie but it, mm. it might just be in the oil the oily fluid which is your phlegm um quite happily while water passes by yeah because i saw um um uh, sort of a picture of the virus um and it's got this spike on it hasn't it which i think uh, yeah the spike, spike protein yeah yeah um, which I think is, uh, you know, um, there's some theories that actually this like spike on the virus is what's making it sort of so uh, infectious, really. You know, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty impressive how it's mutated to be, um, be good at binding the binding to the cells in the upper airway, which allows it to replicate there and then be transmitted through spit and coughing and, and all the kind of secretions of your upper airway, which is obviously something that goes everywhere unless you wash your hands and you're very um, careful. Um, and then also that same spike protein binds to the cells of the lung, which is what causes severe disease in a minority of people and in a smaller proportion kills them. So it has this one spike protein that's managed to mutate to be as effective at transmitting as the cold, but also as deadly as SARS or another one of these severe viruses. So one, one tiny protein on its surface is doing a lot. 
Cool. So from salt water, uh, we managed to get through a lot, <laughs> I think. Um, great. What have we got next? Um, you get infected with coronavirus if you're low in vitamin D. Uh, so actually, this is an just, area you're interested in, right? Yeah. So I was actually just chatting with somebody on Twitter about this today. Partly I was wondering, you know, they sounded, they were so um, into the idea of vitamin D that I was like, are they, and they had this thing about being an entrepreneur on their Twitter. And I was like, are they a vitamin D salesperson? Because <laughs> they were just so adamant that it was the answer. And I think part of the reason why there's been a theory about um, vitamin D being related to coronavirus is vitamin D predominantly we get it from the sun. And most of us in the Northern Hemisphere are deficient of vitamin D. So in the area of London that I work in, most people when we test them for their vitamin D levels are low in vitamin D. And that's because on average, we need anything from 10 to 10 minutes to uh, 30 minutes of sunshine a day to be able to get adequate le levels of vitamin D. And actually we really, really don't get that at the moment. Um, and so because we've seen more coronavirus cases in areas where there is less year-round sun I think that's part of the reason why this theory has come about um, and actually interestingly I did look into it a little bit further and there has been some suggestion within the academic literature that there might be an association with low vitamin d levels and having a higher risk of first respiratory infections and then also something called ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome which is sort of what we're seeing when people are really requiring um, higher levels of oxygen and ventilators in hospital. Um, but I don't know what you make of it, Mesh. I think you're not so convinced about the vitamin D thing. I'm a bit of a cynic, but that's um, coming from the tuberculosis world. So, yeah, vitamin D, what I'd add to what you've said is, um, is maybe that, um, well, firstly, the normal range of vitamin D in the blood is is open to debate, given we can't be sure that it is implicated in any disease. Um, so if you imagine we've humans have created what we say is low and normal and high, um, that has to come through some decision about whether it has any impact on your on your health. And the trouble is we don't have strong evidence that low vitamin D has impact on your health. So then you you ask the question, is that low vitamin D or is that just a, a, a part of the normal spectrum? Yes, there has been evidence it's associated with immunity and that probably explains what you're talking about the the respiratory viruses um you might be at high risk of, of of getting virus infection if you're low in vitamin d but in the tuberculosis world which is where i i know it best um though there have been really promising initial studies the trials of vitamin d preventing tuberculosis um have been really disappointing they've not been published yet but um a tb researcher that i spoke to a few months back said that it's actually not looking that good so um yes it a low vitamin d might might suggest something about your immune system but whether actually taking it helps i don't know yeah so what we actually end up um recommending in gp is Essentially, we don't really test people for vitamin D levels anymore. We get a lot of people coming in with symptoms of low vitamin D, just, you know, achy muscles, just feeling a bit um, lethargic and things like that. And generally, when we test people, they do have low vitamin D. I mean, that might just be a consequence of living in London. Um, but uh, what, what it means is we end up just recommending that people, if they're not able to get the amount of sunshine that they should ideally be getting that you know there's no harm in taking a vitamin d supplement and that can just be you know a standard multivitamin from the pattern shop or whatever for sure and i mean one other thing is you store levels you store vitamin d so if you get lots of sun exposure in the in the summer um which would have to be more the darker your skin is you can um maintain stores for a, at least a few months after um after that but you're right, in the UK, the majority of people wouldn't get enough of that for various reasons. Yeah. I agree. Cool. What have we got mm. next? Um, lemon juice protects you from coronavirus. Um, okay, so I actually managed to find this picture that was going around. Let me just have a look at it. So um, there was this image that was shared on Facebook 
from um, a Chinese scientist who uh, basically was recommending this recipe, um, which is lemon and bicarbonate, mix it together, drink it as a hot tea every afternoon. And um, the action of lemon with baking soda kills the virus and completely eliminates it from the body. And there's also something in there about these two things being alkalizing and having an alkalizing effect on the body and that being beneficial for health as well. Um, mm. So that's the, the myth. What do you make of it? Um, uh, for me, I'm not so convinced. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I could give you strong reasons why I'd feel either way about it, but I suppose without, without knowing uh, more about the, the evidence with this, I'd be sceptical, personally. Yeah. Um, I mean... You mentioned something, though, didn't you? Yeah, I had read a little bit about vitamin C and also zinc, um, there being some evidence that they are... There's been some evidence that vitamin C can help you stave off the cold and also that zinc has been beneficial for colds. And, um, you know, we could we might be able to extrapolate a little bit from that to coronavirus. The evidence doesn't seem to be particularly strong, but clearly I think it has taken a bit of a grip because it seems like everybody has gone out and bought vitamin C tablets. I think I've read that somewhere. Um, mm. But I guess it's just good to know you can get vitamin C from citrus fruits, from broccoli. You can get zinc from chickpeas. Where else? Mm, pumpkin seeds. <laughs> so there's lots of that, you know, if, if you're having a varied, um, colourful diet, then probably you're going to be getting enough vitamins and minerals to keep you good. Um, but yeah, I don't think that there's really any basis in this. And also the thing is, what this um, picture that was going around said was, oh, and the evidence of this is the fact that nobody in this part of the world where they drink lemon juice has got the disease. And actually so since then, actually, even at the time, people did have coronavirus. So... You know, it's pretty quickly debunked. This does like touch on a point though, which is like for a myth to take hold, it has to have some kind of internal logic to it. And um and that's in a sense part of the scientific process, right? And that's um it's become a lot more formalized in the modern world. But um just because something's doing the rounds doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. It's just um if you've only heard it through a WhatsApp message, it's it's less likely to be based in that strong evidence. But yeah, like um, vitamin C could be really important. We just don't know. Um, equally, it could have some negative effect that we've not found yet. So yeah, uh, yeah, this was the message, wasn't it? Yeah, that was it. Thanks for finding it. <laughs> um, Cheers, Gary. I think, I think interestingly, or you touched on an interesting point there, Mesh, which is how scientific research and um, looking into the evidence, you know, like how scientific research and inquiry really comes about. And actually, you need to start off with a theory and something which I've seen a lot of in um, the Twitter sphere. I only actually recently got Twitter, so, you know, it's been keeping me very entertained recently. But um, something which I saw a lot of was this question of, correlation and causation um mm. and it's a big thing that epidemiologists and researchers have to grapple with quite a lot which is you might see um a pattern and then you might associate it with another pattern and it's really important to just try and unpick whether those things just happen to be associated or whether there's actually a causal link between them so just like with the really good picture at the beginning of this um of this chat um you know all of the countries that have had low cases of coronavirus deaths um also yes that's it <laughs> also consume a lot that's of a so that's a good example of correlation not equaling causation or maybe we should actually just all go out and start drinking bubble tea maybe that's the answer another good one i would think is that ice cream causes skin cancer some countries where people eat more ice cream there's more skin cancer, I think. And the what you'd call the confounding variable there is sunshine, obviously. Um, but so if you if you hear the term confound confounding or confounders, you've got to bear in mind that basically what what might on the surface seem like um, a mechanism explaining how one thing relates to the other could just be 
evidence that they both happen at the same time. Yeah. I think I've kind of just said what you said. Yeah, no, but I think it's good. I mean, there's like a whole, um, there's a whole series of, there's like a framework that you can go through to try and work out association with things. So there's also this thing, which is like temporality. So you need to be exposed to something before it can cause a disease at the end of the line. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, there's just like whole frameworks that you can use and maybe we can actually- Yeah, there are loads of different, different checkpoints. Yeah. Uh, dose response, like the more you have, the more likely. Go on, Gary, let's get another one. Yeah, another one in. Oh, God. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. Maybe part of my reaction is just not knowing how any of the Gs work, let alone 5G. Do you know much about 5G? Nothing. Nothing about really. 5G? It's waves and they're fine. That's all I know. But I, I realise that's just as much of a um, superficial understanding as, as anyone else might have. Yeah, so I was sent a video by a friend um, with um, somebody who trained as a doctor who was saying, um, you know, 5G is causing all of these illnesses and actually guess which city in the world is the first to have full 5G coverage. It's Wuhan. Wuhan. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and this might be a correlation, not causation thing, um, but I did look a little bit more into 5G and 5G is the next generation of wireless technology that's being brought out. It is transmitted over radio waves and there's lots of other things that use radio waves as well. So TVs, satellite communications. Um, and radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum of waves. And we do know that some types of waves on that spectrum can be damaging to humans. Like what sort of waves? The ones down the X-ray end yeah. of the spectrum, right? The, oh no. Is that X-ray or wave? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you should know that because that's right. No, that's radiation, right? Ah. Uh, um. Anyway, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> um. There, you know, there has been some concern, and I think actually quite a lot of um public concern about five G to the point where it's been um. You know, the counter arguments of 5G have made it to the mainstream media. So no mainstream media outlet has said 5G might be causing this, but they have reported saying, OK, a lot of people think that 5G might be causing it. So there's definitely something there. And I think part of the reason that people think that 5G might be causing um, issues with regards to health is firstly, that it might impact your immune system. And secondly, that it might transmit the virus. And so maybe on the latter point, I think we can pretty certainly say that it doesn't transmit the virus sounds a bit absurd like i think it would be worth getting someone who with physics or biophysics um experience and yeah. knowledge to to answer this one um yeah i i'd also be cautious because there was a, a a kind of racist rhetoric around um criticisms of 5g and huawei and spying and um i mean there's, mm -hmm. there might be a basis in that as well but there is there are definitely reasons uh, why people might be suspicious of 5G causing health problems and it might fit a certain narrative. Yeah, I guess so far from what we know from testing of all of the Gs, <laughs> they don't seem to have, um, you know, a tangible, measurable uh, negative impact on human health. I just want to say one thing actually about 5G, which is I think part of the challenge around it is that generally the community that I've found um, that uh, thinks about 5G is also one which, uh, it, you know, it, it sits very closely to like a conspiracy theorist community. And so, of course, um, even if we're on here saying, yeah, we don't think that 5G really has that much of an impact, I don't know if that's necessarily going to... Um, change anyone's minds who really strongly believes in 5G. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right, so veganism can save us from future pandemics. Ah, Rita, it's, these all seem, I mean, you're Again. good at them. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just um, hang out with a lot of conspiracy theorists. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, they can, they can, they're not all bad people. Conspiracy yeah. theorist is a, is a term I don't like, actually. No. no. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit, though, about zoonosis, zoonotic disease. Yeah, so zoonosis is, health. Yeah. Is, um, is the transfer of an infectious disease from an animal to human. And there are loads of them. Uh, flu does it. There are plenty of viruses um, that cause hemorrhagic fever that have been known to do it in uh, mainly sub-Saharan Africa, um, but also Southeast Asia. Um, and there are tick-borne zoonoses, so infectious diseases that are transferred from an animal to human via a, a tick that eats it, that sucks its blood and then passes it on. Loads of different zoonoses and um, as you'd imagine uh, the closer humans live to animals um, or work with animals the more likely that an infection is going to jump across that bridge and why is that such an important moment well I suppose over time an infectious agent especially a virus mutates and those mutations lead to it functioning in a slightly different way and if it's surviving in one animal, one species, sorry, then it's transferring, transmitting between uh, individuals within that one species. It will be slowly mutating over time. And by chance, it might mutate to be able to then infect another species. And in that moment, um, the human species, in this case, um, is exposed to a, an infectious agent that is very different to any infectious agent it's seen before. Um, and that means the human species as a, as a collective um, doesn't have much immunity to it. And so that moment where it suddenly enters a new species is, is a dangerous moment for the new host species. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's kind of led to um, uh, lots of study into humans that live closely with animals. Um, and for a number of years, there's been growing evidence that um, humans working and living with animals um, have immunity to infectious agents that we've never seen before. And so there does seem to be a constant transferring of these bugs that happens, um, the, the majority of which probably don't cause any disease at all and they just live happily in, uh, side by side with us. So um, that's a bit of the background of the science behind zoonoses, but that leads on only very tangentially to this myth, which maybe well, you could address. You actually knew a lot about zoonoses, I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> I guess the other thing which also really relates to animal and human health is um, factory farming and the use of antibiotics in factory farming to um, firstly, I guess, uh, deal with some of the conditions that animals are kept under and then also uses growth agents as well um, and um, you know we talk about these like three major sort of global threats or global concerns pandemics antimicrobial resistance which is basically um, antibiotics not being able to work against bugs that infect humans um, and then climate change and so actually the first two do have some association with animals and the ways that we interact with animals um, and the way that we consume animals. And mm. um, I think maybe I might actually just leave it there. <laughs> so possibly, you know, we need to have a look at the way that we're interacting with animals um, uh, en masse. I think at, at, the, at the consumption, at the level of consumption and the level of interaction that we currently have, uh, whether yeah. that means that we should all be vegan. You know, it's, you know, it's I think, yeah, I think maybe an important thing to to add to that is that this is another chance for xenophobic criticism of, of China and Chinese people. And, um, and I actually think that this is a global issue. And we've seen zoonoses happen around the world, um, including the West, Europe and America, um, various swine flu different flus that come from uh, countries all over the world, um, whether developed or developing world countries. And so I think I, I quite like 
discussing frankly our relationship with animals without um without having that extra kind of criticism of any one culture which um you hear quite a lot of um great yeah so we maybe have one more do you think there's time for one more yeah um what about the malaria one it's the malaria one cheers yeah cheers gary so this one mm. come on yeah super interesting um to, to start off with when when i hear that i think you know malaria is a parasite it's just um so much bigger than a virus and it you know um transmitted through a mosquito um from human to human via mosquito and like has a very different life cycle to a virus, goes straight in the blood, then to the liver, then um, replicates in the blood again. And it just seemed a bit odd for me when I heard, first heard um, actually um, a, few, a few scientists propose it and then Donald Trump. Um, yeah, just jumped on it. Really jumped on it, which you've got to take with a pinch of salt, haven't you? Yeah, I guess actually interesting just even within this conversation is the whole concept of drug development and how we develop treatments for certain things. And actually, I think one of the hopes that has been around um, malaria drugs, and by that we're actually really referring to chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, um, which are two sort of quite similar drugs. Um, one of the hopes around... Mm, slightly lost my train of thought, but essentially it takes a long time to develop a new drug. And um, one of the hopes is that we can repurpose a drug that already exists and find that it can be utilized for this because we already know about its safety profile. We know about its dosing. We don't need to be you know, in the lab and creating a new drug straight off the off. Um, so chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are um, two types of drugs which are used for malaria and actually are also used for other conditions like rheumatological conditions predominantly, so um, systemic lupus erythematis and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and they've also been trialled for use in HIV, but they haven't really had that promising results. Do you know much more mm. about that? Um, no, I think you've described it well. Like, um, But I suppose what's less clear is whether it has an impact on a virus, right? And HIV has been shown not to be that effective. And so... Um, I do wonder um, where where the theories come from, what evidence it's based on, you know, um, and um, and if it's going to work. I mean, I, I actually personally think a lot of these uh, drug trials are being um, are are trying to show effect from treating people who are already in quite severe condition. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with um, antiviral drugs is you need to, to treat early, just like um, uh, Tamiflu or Sultamavir, in, in order to prevent the virus replicating enough to cause disease. Mm. A lot of these trials are happening in hospital where patients, people are already really sick. And, and by that point, there might be a mi complex mix of the immune system and the virus causing the disease rather than just the virus. Yeah. What about Tamiflu? Yeah, so there's some moderate evidence now that if you give Tamiflu within two to three days of the sy symptoms of flu starting, then it shortens the length of symptoms for flu. For which, flu, not for coronavirus. No, no, no. And uh, actually, I don't think Tamiflu has really been tried um, trialed for, for, for yeah. coronavirus. Um, because I've seen it in certain parts of the world that it has been on their treatment regimen. Um, mm. Yeah. I think that's very much a just because there's nothing else you can do kind of situation. Yeah. Interestingly, to do with drug development, um, the most effective anti-malarial drug now um, was actually repurposed from a, a medicine used in China for centuries, if not millennia, for fever. And in the 70s, a, a Chinese uh, researcher spent, you know, years and years studying it and she eventually showed that it had an impact against malaria but um it was really not recognized in the international scientific community until the 90s when a western white man researcher found it again and pushed international trials in it and it's now 
the number one um, first line anti-malarial drug for severe malaria and moderate and mild malaria in tablet or in uh, liquid form into the vein. Um, What's that called? Artemisinin. Oh yeah. And um, and I think that story tells you a bit about how um, how drugs are developed how they're discovered rediscovered repurposed and and who actually has more power in um in saying whether something is legitimately you know part of western medicine or not um i think interestingly this outbreak even compared to sars has shown that there's a big been a big shift in academic power towards china and um a, almost all of the um high quality research being published now is not only from Chinese participants and human uh, subjects, but is written by Chinese academics. So, um, uh, yeah, there's a there's a broader point to be said here about where medicines uh, are found, proven to work, and um, who has the power to to decide what is seen in the social science world as, as effective. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, that might be us for today. Yeah, that was yeah. a good session. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks. Um, thanks all for joining us. We've missed your comments today. I think previously when we've done these, we've had people's comments coming up, and actually I really like that. Um, but, you know, uh, we feel you out there. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, I hope the sound was better this time than last time. Yeah, I think, I think it or is it Gary? Um, anyway, yeah. Um, what is it, day 10 or 11 of the lockdown? Who knows? Good. <laughs> Maybe we should do a weekly thing and hopefully it'll only be a few more weeks, but um, yeah. well, fingers crossed. Great. Keep safe. Keep See ya. Bye. Bye.